time to talk about Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, Rome's fifth king. So, Lucius was Rome's fifth mythical or legendary king, and his rise and his fall has got loads to it. He's the first king that really comes across with a real backstory and a narrative, so trust me, it's worth sticking around for. And if you like this kind of thing, click follow, because I'm going to be breaking down what he did, what happened, and all the bits about him in the following videos. Just remember, I also did an episode on the Ancient History Hound podcast, all about him. Right. Let's start with his backstory. It all started here, well, sort of. This is Corinth in Greece. There was a man here called Demaritus, and he was part of a noble family amongst many other noble families. But a rival noble family ended up producing a tyrant. And of course, he was on the watch list. So fearing for his life, he left and he made his way, but not to Rome. He made his way here. This is Etruria and specifically went to a place called Tarquinia. It's actually Tarquina on the map. This might seem a bit odd, but the Etruscans were huge fans of Greek culture. In fact, a lot of the Greek vases that we now have were found here in some of these tombs. So thanks again to the Etruscans. Demaritus settled here and did really, really well. And he had two sons. One of them was called Lucomo. And Lucomo ended up marrying a local noblewoman called Tanaquil. And trust me, Tanaquil is fascinating. She's with this king and she's actually with an ex-queen. But I won't get ahead of myself too much here. Deciding that their best chance to cut it and make it for themselves, the couple headed to that place where anyone could make their name, Rome. So Lacomo and Tanaquil set off to Rome to make their fortune. And on the way there, something very important happened. This is one of these small stories I spoke about in the previous video, which is what we have a lot of when we're talking about Lucomo, who later became Tarquin. And on the way there, he gets attacked by an eagle, or rather his cap gets stolen by an eagle. And he's a bit unsure about what all this means, but Tanaquil is very, very clear. She understands omens, prophecies, and this is in part because she has this general aura about her of someone who knows pretty much everything. And also, she's Etruscan, and Etruscans were linked heavily with understanding omens and prodigies. In short, she said this is a great sign. It means you're destined for greatness. And I think he actually gets his cap back as well even better. Upon getting to Rome, Lucumu changed his name to Lucius to sound a bit more Roman. And it's likely Tanaquil was behind this because she understood the political game. She herself was a noble. Now it's worth noting that when Tarquin or Lucius arrived, a king was already there and this was the previous king, or rather the current king. This was King Ancus, the fourth Roman king. And he seems to have gone really well with the king, in part because he was very wealthy or made himself very wealthy and started loaning the king money or at least made his wealth available to the king. And he ended up becoming a very close confidant of the king. So here's Lucius playing the game very well. And it goes a bit further because when the king dies, he realises that he's got a good chance of getting election because he's made himself very popular with the people. But there's a problem. Ancus had got a few sons, and for whatever reason, these sons thought that they were just either automatically going to become king, or that they'd be, you know, first in line, as it were, or a very popular choice. So when the elections came up, somehow, don't ask me how, Tarquin arranged for a hunting trip for those sons to be away, and that somehow they were absent from being elected. They couldn't be the next king, and he instead won the election. And this, as you probably guess, has repercussions much later on. In 616 BCE, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, or let's just call him Tarquin, became the fifth king of Rome. And to start off his career, he kicked off with the thing that kings often did, which was declare a war on someone. And he went to war with a tribe you might think was unusual. Now, he went to war with the Etruscans, and that's unusual because that's where Lucius was from, or rather Tarquin had been from. And this also had an interesting outcome. After defeating the Etruscans, ambassadors turned up, and these brought with them a number of gifts. And one of these became a staple when you think about Rome, the toga. So yeah, the toga was apparently introduced to Rome from the Etruscans. Tarquin wasn't just associated with how people dressed and their somewhat iconic garb. He was also associated with two major constructions that are both at Rome today. And in the next video, I'll pick up on both of these and why they had to happen. Tarquin was associated with two structures in ancient Rome that are actually still there today. Here's the first. 
I need to start with the basic premise that actually informs the situation of both the structures that I'll talk about. This is a really good map of ancient Rome. You can notice how the topography is quite different. It's certainly different to how Rome is today. It's all hills and valleys, and that's pretty much how ancient Rome was. Remember those famous hills. And the Circus Maximus was in a valley. It was in a marsh. You can actually see where it is. So Rome had the initial problem of dealing with what was effectively marshland. They had to reclaim this land before they could use it, which is what they did. The early circus wasn't anything like this. This is a far later model. And scenes from films like Ben-Hur, that's much later in the day. Remember, that's centuries after. It was initially just land. It was just a racing track. And that's actually quite interesting itself. Because originally it was used to have chariot races and boxing matches. And chariot races certainly were a big Etruscan thing. So again, we have that link with the Etruscans. The early chariot races and horse races there were all linked to this guy, Neptune. Nice trident. So the early Circus Maximus was largely about having a place where religious worship could take place in the form of races, which is something we see elsewhere in antiquity. And it's worth remembering that the Circus Maximus was the place. It was the place where big events happened. Forget the Colosseum, that was much later. The Colosseum doesn't come into play until the first century CE, the imperial period. If you wanted old school, it was all about the Circus Maximus. Here's something about the second construction that was associated with Tarquin, the Cloaca Maxima, or Great Sewer of Rome. I need to start again with this really cool model of archaic or ancient Rome. As you can see, topography of it is hills and valleys. And it all started in this area here. And Rome wanted to make it accessible, but the problem was the Tiber was flooding it all the time. So apparently Tarquin raised it by three metres. But even this wasn't enough. And to help out, they did one of two things. They either used an existing waterway, which they sort of standardised, or they dug a channel an open channel and this was apparently the early cloaca maxima pretty much an open channel of water used for drainage in the area even when it became that big underground thing as rome grew developed and was raised on different levels it wasn't a sewer as we would have understood it today for example the chances are very few of any toilets in the households in rome would have been connected to it this was to deal with pure surface water, which there was a lot of. It wasn't really there to take away human waste. The Romans did that in a number of different ways. Another really cool thing about all of this is that some of the stones that have been used have been dated and dated to the 6th century BC, which was apparently when Tarquin was king. And finally, this area, the area that the Cloaca Maxima helped to drain, that became the Forum. So yeah, pretty important. The end of Tarquin was as dramatic as his rise and came to a head, literally, around 579 BCE. At this point, Tarquin was around 80, so there was a bit of political unrest. This might simply have been because people at that time were trying to work out who's going to be next. Just remember that the monarch at Rome at that point was elected. So perhaps there were contenders, candidates, people just thinking, you know, don't want to be disrespectful, but when am I going to get my chance? Now, you might remember that Tarquin succeeded Ancus, Rome's fourth king, and Ancus had had sons. And these sons at the time had thought that they were going to either become the next king of Rome or that they'd be the main contenders for it. And if you remember in that video that I did, I explained that Tarquin had basically got them out of Rome for some sort of a hunting trip or something. In short, they weren't around for the elections and they felt cheated by this. And so now it was their turn. They came back for some vengeance. The sons of Ancus hired some assassins who dressed as shepherds. And again, if you've been watching my videos on the Kings of Rome, whenever shepherds appear, you know there's going to be a fight. And the shepherds quarrelled outside the home of Tarquin. And Tarquin, being the really good king that he was, said, oh, well, I can sort this out. Let me arbitrate. And they came into his home and took their chance. They put an axe in his head. And that was the end for Tarquin. But whilst it might have been the end for Tarquin, it wasn't really the end. Let me explain. Tanaquil, the wife of Tarquin, and basically the brains behind everything he'd ever achieved, stepped in. She said to the people, no, 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 he's not dead. He's just not very well. And in his place, she sat around getting her choice in. Someone called Servius Tullius. And we'll hear about him in the subsequent videos I'll do on him. And his story, again, well, you've got to watch it to believe it. So make sure you click follow if you want to hear more about this upcoming and sixth king of Rome, Servius Tullius.